Yeah, that's um, even here where people are pretty process oriented in Oregon, which is called the, you know, the the communist state of the West Coast. <laughs> Zoning even then is still going to be a hard sell, I think. <laughs> Well, it is, but it's about to happen, whether they like it or not, because we've got wave energy coming, we've got aquaculture coming, we've got all kinds of spatial use issues that are going to force zoning to happen. Maybe they'll call it something else, just to you know make things easier, but but it will happen. And um, and what we saw partly out of the marine reserve process was um, this idea that even if you don't have groups as uh, well organized and sort of cohesive as port, the, the, the local fishing ports have started to form these action teams to start to map uses and figure out, you know, well, who's doing what where and what's really possible, what's desirable, and so on. And I think that's a positive um, step as well in, in terms of getting everybody involved. I was wondering if you could both talk about uh, sort of regulatory turf. So to speak, you're both talking about issues, especially if you're strictly bottom up and combined to top down bottom up that uh, occur in the sound of working with agencies in cities and counties who don't see their constituency as being on the water. Um, and especially you start talking about Forest Service, BLM, uh, cities and, uh, that aren't on the waterfront. Uh, what was the if, what would you recommend or what lessons did you learn about the impetus for getting them to the table and sort of convincing them that there was something to be gained by expending resources to participate in a process that won't help them in the end directly in the sense of budgetary perspective? Yeah, the um, getting the the multi sectors um, engaged in the and salmon was actually a good place to start because they integrate over, you know, headland streams all the way out to the open Pacific and back. So BLM and Forest Service and the ports and the farmers all actually did want to come to the table because people were going to start telling them what they're going to do with the uplands as well as the estuary and the, and the fisheries. So that was a good starting point and they th there was definitely a lot of discussion about what is the incentive for me to stay at the table and discuss and some of them got got funding to do um, implementation of some parts of the plan others avoided lawsuits as people have said before um, one thing that's interesting about the salmon ecosystem plan here that was approved there have been no lawsuits yet and it was a seven-year process and it's been implemented now for three years. So it has maybe avoided that, what in the past would have inevitably been a lawsuit, but um, we'll see. So um, there are some groups that are not at the table. There are 21 treaty tribes and two of them are not participating. And there are other sectors um, that aren't as active as some people would like them to be. Forestry is not because they had just gone through a huge agreement with the feds. Um, so it, it, the, some of them are more participating than others, but I think having a, a species like salmon that integrate over that huge part of the ecosystem was what really helped us here. Mm -hmm. It was, um, so the fishermen had this idea of extending their st uh, stewardship plan <laughs> onto land and uh, and that was a hard sell and it took a while um, but I think what it came back to again is that idea of, of doing something that will benefit the community and and that um, and and getting that community um, idea in there so they're having discussions with landowners and so on now about what it means to be part of the stewardship area. I mean, they're still going through a lot of definition process at this point. Um, but, you know, they're also planning, at, as far as the ocean side of things go, uh, there's a realization that the state is very unlikely to have enforcement capability. And so they're, they're talking about how are we going to self-enforce? What are we going to do? Um, and they have plans for that. Yeah. For who they're going to call. They're not going to go out and shoot people. <laughs> I, I wanted to add one more thing. Um, the, there's, and I was interested in the Alaska case where the FACA rules kind of got in the way a little bit. Um, 
In here, people, when they signed the agreement to participate in this multi-sector process, they signed um, a, a, a sort of a communal agreement saying they were not going to abrogate any of their authorities to anybody else at the, at the table, um, and so that it was all retaining their own authorities for their city or their county or their fishery, um, but that they would agree to communicate and collaborate on the, the decision. So it was some, that gave comfort to everybody that they weren't giving up any of their own jurisdictions. But um, yeah, maybe later we can talk about why that didn't One of the things that I've experienced in, in Chesapeake Bay, San Francisco Bay Area, and, and uh, now in Louisiana is that when you, when you talk about uh, uh, systems like each of you described, uh, you sit down with a map and you say, okay, these, these are the changes we want to make. Some of them involve changes in practice. Some of them involve physical changes to the system in terms of restoration efforts. And, but when it actually comes down to it, you, you know, you come out with this map and you, you plan it out, but, but it's clear that you cannot uh, do all of these things at once. And so everything that you do upstream in time and space affects uh, downstream in ways that you can't predict. And how much, uh, I mean, what I've seen is, is that those, those effects have caused uh, what appeared to be a relatively cohesive working group to kind of splinter when the, uh, the the effects that have been resulted from these upstream things in time and space have diverged from what the original expectations were. And, and how, how, how would you see that playing out uh, in systems here where they've already survived at least one of these things, I mean, I guess a Puget Sound situation, but, but it, to me that's one of the real challenges when you're dealing with with these sorts of things that where you know the plan is now but the practice is putting this in a place that takes a long time and things change and so it, to me it's, it's one of the things that I think you know, is is going to be uh, one of the biggest challenges in implement, implementing ecosystem space fisheries management because uh, we, we sort of make plans and uh, but the implementation process changes the plants. Yeah. So it's... Well, I, I think that's really important. I mean, this live fish fishery, which is the one of the primary fisheries that's represented, you know, in this port program, um, is uh, only really started 15 years ago. Uh, I mean, that's a relatively new fishery in that area. So what's, what are things, wh what the Port Orford folks are trying to do with their plan is make the argument that they're actually trying to set it up to be adaptive. Um, so that as new fisheries, as new uh, forces come in, use issues and whatnot, they can actually work, you know, work with that um, by setting up a process for how to get people to the table to have the discussions. Yeah, I think what you're bringing up is really important in um, the this happened here, it crystallized for me in an example just last year. The, the salmon plan was about a seven year big collaborative process. Then there was some resistance on the part of the people who were involved in that, which was probably two thirds of the stakeholders that are, there was another third added to do the whole system. But orcas got listed after the salmon. And the orca's main food source are the listed salmon. So there was a huge, tension between the people who wanted to recover salmon and not mission creep and say, oh, I don't want to add another high, high, high profile species. And the focus for the orcas is partly on their food source, which is recovering the salmon, but it's partly on toxic contaminants, which focuses you on a whole other part of the system, which is land-based pollutants and atmospheric deposition. Um, and what they did, so there was a lot of tension for a while in the brand new partnership. Um, is they had a, an orca salmon summit, and they got, um, this is pro Seattle process, they got um, the orca people and the salmon people to compare notes, they gave presentations on the science on each side, and they came up with some common 
areas that they overlapped, which is that in order for the orcas to recover, their food source had to increase, which would mean the same thing for the salmon recovery. The salmon have to increase. So that really relieved the tension. They found some common goals, and there's a lot less grumbling about the toxics work in the salmon community now. So that was one way to help them stay focused on some shared objective as opposed to getting diverted the way you're talking about. But I mean, we're so much younger than the Chesapeake, so this might happen in the future. And um, I don't know how to head it off, really. Well, I can tell you that in the San Francisco Bay Area, what happened was that when I went out there to start working, it was right fast because that was a big fishery, but it was introduced. Uh, then uh, Pacific, the winter run should have salmon got listed. And there was a whole discussion about water management that had to occur because of uh, dealing with managing for uh, uh, the, the winter run Chinook run, and uh, there was a whole debate about water use and that whole bit. And uh, the striped bass was now a pariah, so we, uh, uh, the, the work that we were doing kind of got sidetracked. But at the same time, about a few years later, Delta Smelt got listed, and the uh, water management practices that favor winter run Chinook. Uh, are deleterious to Delta Smelt and vice versa. So the group just went, I mean, it's splintered like, uh, so I hope it doesn't happen, but that's, yeah. you know, those kind of times, the ESA things are particularly yeah. thorny, but those sorts of time series of changes can make it tough. Mm -hmm. That's like a good allocation yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I know this is a hard one in Seattle, but uh, so we had this grand plan to be somewhere in 2020, but are there tangible things that have been done? I mean, have they taken on, I can imagine they would do the little things, the community sorts of things that are happening in uh, uh, Oregon, but, but the big ones that are you going to curtail shipping, or are you going to get Christine Gregoire to stop polluting them? You know, is there any energy to move in that direction, or is it still pretty much status quo? Yeah, I think um, it's it's too early to tell. So I think I feel heartened by what's in the first version of the plan. So they're going to iterate that plan every two years, and the the land based runoff and source of toxics is one of the big issues that's affecting a lot of the goals because it's affecting human health goals and species in particular and that's a really hard one politically to jump onto and they did it so that's good that they did that one thing they have not touched at all is the marine fisheries so salmon fisheries they tackled it's not there yet, but it's the, at least they've agreed on targets and objectives and strategies. But the marine fish are just proposed for listing. A lot of people think they are not well managed. That's debatable. But they're declining. And um, that has not even been on anyone's list in this first ecosystem planning effort, which is surprising to me, given the food web implications and what we know about their status. So. I think it's a real mixed um, scorecard right now. I think they have been brave in some of the things they put on their list, but what they actually will do in this first two years to implement that, you know, it depends. We, we, the legislature just closed, so we'll see what they funded. And um, I don't, I really don't know. It's a lot like like we've talked about. I think your case where you have a federal, federally managed fishery and not a whole lot of other people right. mucking around out there is. Um, Something we can, it's nice to, to, for the simplicity, but also maybe we can learn from the, the clarity that you have in your targets. And I think another key thing is to set a whole, set targets for these other ecosystem elements where right now it's just let's improve them. So the only targets are the fishery ones, and that's not enough, so. Yeah, on this on this question of scaling, scaling up, scaling down, and that whole question, and stakeholder involvement, you, Selena, you mentioned something about rewards, and I'm interested in what you have to say about the challenge that you indicated in rewarding good behavior, which we learned we 
we've been talking a lot about sociology and, and stakeholder involvement and, and behavior change. And there's been a lot of work done that, that shows us that rewarding good behavior works much better than trying to punish bad behavior. We've been hearing a lot about the trouble with enforcement, too. So what, how would you address that challenge of, of sort of rewarding good behavior at the local level when you're trying to manage at the macro level? That's much too big for a scientist like me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just threw a couple things out there, and I think these are discussions that Port Orford um, and other communities that are trying things like this have to have with the regulatory agencies that they have to work with. Um, now, Port Orford has a memorandum of understanding uh, with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and it doesn't have a lot of specifics in it, but at least it's a start. It's a, it, it, it's a way for the state to acknowledge what they're doing. It doesn't say, and so we're going to let you catch more black rockfish or something, but it, it does uh, create an acknowledgement of uh, that they're there and that they have this stewardship plan and that's okay for them to have that and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's discussions that have to be had at, at the council level if there's talk about uh, allocation community-based allocation and so on, um, th those are, are big discussions in other rooms, uh, um, probably over long time periods. Uh, but hopefully we can come up with some things that are, are workable. I, I mean, maybe uh, Don has some thoughts on that. I don't know. <laughs> so we can uh, open it up for sort of a broader some broader questions than just to the panelists here for a few minutes. I think we have about five left before the break. Tim tells me it'd be okay to ask some more general questions. Um, I, have, I have a general comment, and it also relates to uh, Mary's presentation, which I thought was very good in, in challenging us more broadly. And, and that is, I wonder if we consider ecosystem-based management, uh, particularly ecosystem-based fisheries management, uh, more as food web manipulation rather than looking at the ecosystem consequences and feedbacks overall. And I wonder, and Mary highlighted this in her talk, how much attention we actually give to habitat and how habitat will change. It is a dynamic feature and yet often in these discussions we think about, about it as static. Um, we're very good at modelling pelagic habitat we're sort of okay in modeling at least the uh, availability of biogenic habitat, but I don't hear any discussions about modeling or forecasting changes in the geomorphological environment. And in Mary's case, that's going to be very important. Uh, and I just wonder, if, for me, I, I don't know about most of these systems, and I wonder how much attention we're actually giving to habitat modeling uh, in trying to forecast system change. And I, I personally think that habitat modelling might actually be what we need to do to be able to forecast long-term change uh, to ecosystems rather than concentrating on how specific species will change. Anybody want to take on one of the other speakers? Can you take on that question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that, that was a point that I, I tried to make directly was that my sort of view of what ecosystem-based fisheries management was, was taking fishing and moving it into a, a larger framework that included uh, habitat changes, climate changes, and, and other things. And so rather than fishing being the, the driver, it's, it's part of the system that is being driven. It's affecting both the fishery ecosystem as, as well as the larger e ecosystem, and including humans. And to me, um, that, that, that's going to be uh, if we, the, the way, because it's really going to be the, the only way to, to, to move from, I think, the tactical sort of management that we've been doing that Jason described very eloquently the other day to the strategic sorts of things that he, he, he talked about. But, and Billy and folks have been working on, they're not working their way up into the management arena yet. And, to me, the, the only way to do that is to take and make fishing and fishery systems part of the, a larger ecosystem framework. And that challenge is enormous. But uh, to me, that, that is my view of what ecosystem-based fisheries management 
is, and that's why I asked the question at the end, is ecosystem-based fisheries management equivalent or equal to ecosystem-based management? <laughs> Another comment, anyone? I will say that on this coast, just getting a static look, one snapshot of habitat on the west coast it has yet to be achieved, let alone any changes in habitat. But there is new legislation on the west, at least in the U.S., to focus on some mapping activities of just, you know, the base um, habitat, multi beam at least our own waters. So. so that's one advantage that the Gulf has is oil and gas. You're <laughs> speaking from a point of view of somebody who actually has. We gas. know every square. We know what every square inch of the bottom is. Yeah. Right. And on the West Coast, it, that, it's really a patchwork of what we do and do not know. So. Oh, one more question, I'm told. <laughs> there was really a comment actually you know, on this debate. I mean, a lot of this depends on the scale at which you want to modify the ecosystem. And I mean, habitat is actually a great example because. You know, in our institution, um, we model changes to the coastal environments that are used in planning nuclear new builds, for example. And there you'll work over a 50-year time scale, and that absolutely guides your decision making. If we're managing um, a salt marsh or um, an estuarine fish nursery area, we're not working on that time scale at all. We completely ignore the outputs of those models. And, and it's almost just a culture that's emerged within the different management systems. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure it's actually a bad thing. A lot of the time, management is about managing within the phase you're in and ensuring that the system in its current phase is maintained in a form that's reasonably robust to any of the shocks that might occur in the future. So I think you get that separation. And to an extent, it's unavoidable unless you hold your hands up and say the world's changing and we can't do anything. Well, I think we're at the end of this question and panel discussion, so I want to thank all the speakers again. And we're back here at 3.30. 3.30. <laughs>
So I first wanted to start, I've got, we've heard, I would divide the talks we've heard so far into theory and practice. And that's a, the subtlety between theory and practice is, is often difficult to understand. And I think it's best told by one of my favorite anecdotes. And that is this 12 year old boy was taking, is reading his vocabulary list. And one of the things was distinguish between theory and practice. And he was stumped. So he, uh, he asked his uh, father, he said, Dad, what's the difference between theory and practice? And his father was a, really wanted to give him a, a strong lesson, said, OK, here's, here's what you do. Go ask your 16-year-old sister if she'd sleep with someone she never met for a million dollars. And the uh, kid was very, you know, so he went up and asked his sister. And she took it seriously. She didn't treat it lightly. And uh, she said, oh, of course I would, a million dollars. That's a, that's a no-brainer. So the kid comes back and goes, so that's what I thought. OK, now go ask your mother the same question. The mother took, again, she took it seriously, she, and she, she really took it seriously, and she worked out all the debts they could pay off with a million dollars. She checked, you know, just one night, just one night, and uh, came back and, uh, and said, yes, I, I would do that. Said, okay, hmm, okay. Uh, now let's try your 18-year-old brother if he'd sleep with a man he never met for a million dollars. And 18-year-old brother sort of, you know, grossed out of it, said, million, of course I'd do it, so. so. <laughs> million dollars the million dollars and, I mean, and, and that was before the stock market crash it'd probably be, it'd probably be half a million would do now and, uh, and so the father said okay there's your lesson in this family in theory we have three millionaires <laughs> in practice we have two sluts and a queer <laughs> okay so first, this is, a, this is a slide I just added after the last discussion, and that is that all of my talk is really going to deal with, well, almost all my talk is going to deal with what I call the small ecosystem-based management. That is, ecosystem-based fisheries management, how, how fisheries and fisheries regulation interacts with trophic and environmental considerations. Um, but Mary in particular, but Selena to some extent, and quite a few speakers have talked about what I'd call the bigger uh, ecosystem-based management, where all of a sudden you're, t you're tying fisheries in with a whole host of other very complicated issues, uh, like land use, et cetera. Um, and in many ways, it's unavoidable, particularly when you get where fisheries is really a small part of the system, and all these other things, it happens in almost all the estuaries, et cetera. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that very much. Um, so why are we here? Okay, and, and I think the basic reason that we're here, that ecosystem-based management has, has, has had such a high profile, is the general perception that single species management has failed, or at least is insufficient. Um, and so I would just say, well, would all this work be unnecessary if we had simply got single species management right? Um, and, uh, and, and, or, and or, or another alternative, is it really a, a, a result of a misconception about the status of the dynamics and the, uh, uh, of, and the status and dynamics of marine ecosystems? In other words, is it all a mistake? You know, is it, is it really a mistake? And I want you, uh, so well, you can <laughs> think about this as, you know, as if this is from a cynical perspective, I have to admit that if, say, in New Zealand, where the fishing industry pays basically all the costs, I have to admit, I think they would have a good point that, that, uh, that you know, is, is what ecosystem management is really a full employment program for marine biologists. <laughs> or that is, and especially, or if, if you're familiar with the local situation, is it the Columbia River of marine fisheries, <laughs> where, where $400 million a year is spent on, on salmon management, um, or sa on, on salmon in various ways. Well, let's start with a thought experiment. Imagine you had a perfectly managed single species fishery that uh, you know, was text textbook fishery, either by a, an agency uh, or a, a fleet sector or a sole owner or any, any kind of a system that was really working perfectly to maximize the sustainability of the fishery and the profitability. You know, just the ideal fishery that we probably don't have any, but there are probably some out there that would, would, look, uh, would look a lot like that. What, what would go wrong under that circumstance? I mean, what, what, why, if we stood, stood, looked at it from a societal perspective, what would be the problems, okay? The first thing is, if I was the sole owner of a, of a, of a, of a, of a sea fishery, 
uh, not worry, you know, with only worried about my own profitability, I wouldn't worry about bycatch if threatened to endangered species or charismatic species. And in the U.S., that would cause you problems because you'd bump against the, the Endangered Species Act or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So, you know, single species management simply isn't sufficient in itself to cover those issues. You would also run into uh, to, to problems that you, you, you would have what I call ecosystem transforming impacts of fishing. Uh, for instance, I, 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 if I had complete control of my fishery, um, I might be inclined to hammer whatever was preying on my fishery. So if I was a shrimp fisherman, I might be quite happy to get rid of cod and haddock and things like that. Uh, if, and and I've heard, I, I know I've been told stories of, of what's called the development of shrimp fisheries. And that is the first thing you have to do is prepare the ground. And that involves really fishing hard to get rid of the skates and the rays and the other crap that simply get in the way of producing what you want to produce, okay? Uh, you would also uh, have habitat-modifying habitat gear um, that, uh, that from many societal perspectives would be considered uh, undesirable. But I would say that other than those two things, uh, it would actually look pretty good. I mean, I think we would all be pretty happy if all the U.S. and, and international fisheries uh, had taken care of all of that. They managed the single species well, worried about bycatch of, of species that we had that were on the list of concerns, and we weren't really modifying uh, ecos transforming ecosystems a lot. So again, maybe we wouldn't be here if, uh, if we were there. And, and so I'd say that I, I just think emerging from monotox is the real core of ecosystem-based management is first doing single species right, getting F at or below F, M, S, Y uh, for single species, keeping fleet capacity within resources, preventing bycatch of key, uh, of key species. These were key to avoid. I mean, they don't have to be endangered, protect, protected, charismatic. There's a whole bunch of species we care about, but let's admit it, there's a bunch of species we don't care about. Uh, I don't think we'd be too concerned if arrowtooth flounder were, were not at high abundance or something like that, okay? Um, and I know New England fishermen wouldn't be too concerned if, if dogfish were at lower abundance. Um, and it could be done by bycatch avoidance through incentives, by area closures, by gear modification. And you also want to make sure that you, you avoid destructive fishing practices, both by regulating some kinds of gear and particularly by closing sensitive habitats to gears that might, that might damage them. So, Tim, <laughs> my cab, my cab's coming. Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more. Okay. But what I, what I want to argue is that from from the ecosystem fisheries management, again, not the big issue with land use, et cetera, but from fisheries, the rest is really fine tuning. If we could do that other stuff, we'd be 80% of the way there. Um, but. Ecosystem-based management is a reality. We, we, you know, it's on the table. It's going to happen. It is happening. So it's here to stay. And so the real question is, how do we how do we do it right? Um, so the first thing I want to go through is the fact that there really is a lot of slack in successful single species management. That is, we can succeed at single species management over a wide range of ecosystem impacts. And this is a couple slides from a paper that I, uh, I'm, it's coming out in Marine Policy. It introduces the concept I stole from, from Alec McCall called pretty good yield. And the idea is that fisheries isn't really about, max, shouldn't be about maximizing yield, it should be about getting good yield. And this is a standard graph from age structure models for the, the, the yield as a function of the level of stock depletion across a range of density dependence uh, in, the, in the stock with the, uh, with the, with the uh, very little density dependence.